Caccino Rossini was born in 1792, five months after his parents got married, and that taught him a lesson. He was never early for another appointment in his whole life. Rossini was the laziest boy in town. He even became the laziest man in town, but that, of course, was later. He also managed to be born on February the 29th, which he considered a good break because he didn't have to bother with so many celebrations. On his 18th birthday, he was already 72. Rosini's father combined jobs as municipal trumpeter and inspector of public slaughterhouses, so Giacchino grew up liking horns and Bologna. Luckily, his mother was a singer, so Giacchino grew up liking operas too. So when Rosini's father wasn't trumpeting in town, he was traveling all around the country playing in local bands and theaters. And since Mama Rossini was out on the road a lot also, Giacchino was often left with his grandmother. She found that Giacchino was like any other boy except lazier. He wouldn't study, he wouldn't work, and he hated to practice. His tactics drove his first piano teacher to drink, which really wasn't that difficult since the teacher, whose name was Prenetti, manufactured brandies on the side. Prenetti liked to go to sleep standing up in a corner of the room, all wrapped in a cloak, and when he woke up he made Rossini play scales using only his thumbs and index fingers. Actually, the things Giacchino liked best were throwing stones at his playmates and cracking jokes in church. As punishment, he had to pump bellows for the local blacksmith. That he hated even more than practicing. Eventually, his grandmother had enough of all this, and Giacchino was boarded out with a pork butcher. Here it is again, in Bologna. He still didn't take music seriously, but one day the butcher decided it was about time the kid did some work around the place. Suddenly, Giacchino became terribly interested in music and announced that he couldn't do any work around the place because he was too busy studying to be a boy soprano. That worked pretty well until his voice changed. Then Rossini started composing as a career, since he found he could do it in bed. My favorite bedroom story about Rossini dates from many years later. He was snuggled under the blankets, writing a duet for an opera when the page slipped out of his hand and fell under the bed. Since he was too lazy to get up and fetch it, he simply took another sheet and composed an entirely new duet. Later, when a friend stopped by and retrieved the music for him, Rossini couldn't bear the thought of letting all that energy go for nothing, so he added an extra part on the page, turning the duet into a trio for the same opera. Speaking of operas, Rossini wrote a whole lot of them, but that was only so that he could make enough money to stay in bed and not write operas anymore. When he was 37, he reached his goal. For the next 40 years, Everybody kept waiting for Rossini to break down and compose another opera, but he never did. He was much too happy in bed. He did write a piece called Miscarriage of a Polish Mazurka, and one called Profound Sleep with Startled Awakenings, and even a hygienic prelude for morning use, but no more operas. It would only be fair to tell you about some of the operas that Rossini did write. The first one came along when he was 18, and it was about the love life of a girl named Fanny Mill. A couple of letters up the alphabet, and he would have had a smash hit. As it was, some people complained that Rossini had done too much research for the romantic duets. His second opera was even more daring. He told of a suitor who gets rid of his rival by convincing him that the lady they admire is really a castrato in disguise. Well, the police closed that one down after three performances. The Buddha would get sooner, but the chief had to see it several times to get the point. Rosini's third opera was produced in Venice, where the police were more lenient, and when it was over, somebody let loose an enormous flock of doves, canaries, and wild pheasants from one of the boxes. Rosini took it as a compliment, which was probably just as well. As his operas improved and Rosini became more popular, 
requests for new productions started coming in from all over Italy. Giacchino would much rather have stayed in bed, of course, but he needed the money, so he churned out dozens of operas, often swiping arias from one work to fit the next. What really annoyed him was having to write double endings. With Tancredi, for instance, people complained that the sad scenes were spoiling their digestion, and the manager wouldn't leave Rossini alone until he had written the last minute reprieve for the hero. The same thing happened with Othello. The audience began whooping and yelling as soon as the last scene started, trying to warn Desdemona to beat it before Othello finished her off. They kept it up night after night until Rossini had to create a whole new finale where the lovers kiss and make up. All this time, Rossini was getting more and more famous. In 1823, he figured out that 23 of his operas were being played in various parts of the world, including the Middle East, where one potentate couldn't enjoy his breakfast unless a brass band played Rossini tunes outside his window. Even after he retired, Rossini could hardly keep track of all the honors that came pouring in. The Sultan of Turkey bestowed upon him the order of Micham Iftiha, and the sausage maker in Modena sent along some Zamponi and Capaletti. He got a ribbon from the King of Sweden and a snuff box from the Tsar of Russia. In London, King George invited Rossini down to the palace to sing duets. And in Madrid, King Ferdinand offered him the bottom half of a cigar he had been smoking. <laughs> in Paris, King Charles named Rossini Inspector General of Singing in France. Nobody knew what that was supposed to mean, but since the title included a handsome salary, Rossini felt he ought to be doing something to earn it. The best he could come up with was wandering around Paris, inspecting the songs of street beggars and drunks. On his 17th birthday, he was now 17 and a half, see Libya, a group of friends arrived with a surprise announcement. They had collected 20,000 francs to erect a Rossini monument. What a waste of money, the composer groaned. Give me the cash and I'll stand on the pedestal myself. Despite all this, Rossini's journey to immortality was not without its share of detours. Several of his efforts were hissed off the stage, and on one occasion, Rossini sent a wordless review of his latest production to his mother, a drawing of a large straw-covered bottle, the kind Italians call a fiasco. But most devastating of all was the scalping that originally greeted Rossini's comic masterpiece, The Barber of Seville. <laughs> began when Rossini accepted a commission to write an opera for the Roman Carnival celebration of 1816. His contract specified that he would compose the music, adapt it to suit the convenience of the singers, preside at all rehearsals, and conduct the first three public performances from the keyboard. For this he would be paid 400 scudi and given a brass button suit to wear at the premiere. Escuto, as any 19th century Italian can tell you, was worth about mm, 97 cents. American, that is. Well, no sooner had Rossini signed on the dotted line than the impresario came over and said that, by the way, he had forgotten to mention that the Roman carnival came early that year, and could he please have the opera in three weeks, because otherwise Rossini wasn't going to get the scudi or the suit. Most composers in that sort of situation would have become hysterical. But Rossini just shrugged. 
Then he became hysterical. Tossing aside the libretto that had originally been given him, he rushed to the library and took out a famous play that had previously been made into operas by at least half a dozen other composers. It was Beaumarchais' The Barber of Seville. Please remind me to tell you about Beaumarchais sometime. He made clocks, smuggled guns, stole state secrets, and married rich widows who died a few months afterwards. Acts, he didn't say. Rossini next converted his house into a music factory. He sat writing at a piano in one room with his librettist spewing out verses in the next and copyists lining the corridors working out the parts. As soon as the ink was dry, the pages were spit to the singers who were rehearsing upstairs. Remember how Handel solved similar problems? Rossini also knew perfectly well that he could never compose an entirely new opera in such a short time. So he surrounded himself with all the music he had ever written. He pored over his sketchbooks and stormed through his earlier operas, particularly the frops, which people wouldn't remember. Then, like a scavenger, he swooped down, lifting a march tune here, a lago there, here a chorus, there an aria. When he couldn't find anything of his own that he liked, he borrowed a few tunes by other composers. Finally, the job was done. Out of bits and pieces of a dozen old scores, Rossini had created a fresh, brilliantly exciting new one. During those three weeks, he had not left the house. He had hardly taken time to eat, and he had grown a wild black beard. So in more ways than one, Rossini was now ready for the barber. When Donizetti heard that Rossini had completed the whole opera in three weeks, he just shook his head. Yes, yes, he said. Rossini always was a lazy fellow. As usual, Rossini waited until the day before the premiere to write the overture, which was to be based on Spanish folk tunes, and just when it began to look as if he really would have to sit down and compose it, he got a brilliant idea. He rushed around telling everybody that he had written the most masterful overture of his career, only it had mysteriously disappeared. They searched like crazy all over the place, but Naturally, the music never turned up. So Rossini happily went back to his trunk and got out a brand old overture he had written some years earlier for an opera about a Greek emperor. When that flopped, Rossini had used the same music as the overture to another opera about an English queen. That one didn't do too well either. But Rossini was a hard man to discourage. He crossed off the two other titles, wrote... Barber of Seville Overture in capital letters and lay down for a quick nap. score may have been finished, but Rossini's troubles were only beginning. I mentioned that other composers also had used the same story for their operas. Well, one of them was still around. His name was Giovanni Paisiello, and his Barber of Seville had been quite successful about 34 years earlier. When Paisiello heard that Rossini was trying to top him, he was furious. He announced that Rossini was, and I quote, licentious composer who paid little attention to the rules of his art, a debaser of good taste, and a man whose great facility results only from a good memory." End quote. 
Rossini tried to smooth things over by changing the name of his opera to The Useless Precaution, but it proved to be just that. Paisiello was still furious. When the night of the premiere arrived, Paisiello stayed home sulking, but he sent a group of friends to the theater to carefully organize a whole series of spontaneous demonstrations during the performance. His people hooted and laughed and hissed and yelled until the singers hardly could hear the orchestra. Naturally, the performers got rattled. Almaviva neglected to tune his guitar for the serenade to Rosina, and while he was monkeying with the pegs, a string snapped in his face. Don Basilio came out and immediately tripped over his costume. Another singer fell through a trapdoor. Scenery toppled over, and during the finale of the first act, somebody let a cat loose on the stage. The opera was the shambles, and Rossini went home in despair. He says that Rossini only wept three times in his life. One, when he heard a fellow composer sing, once after the premiere of the Bach of Seville, and the third time at a picnic, when the truffled chicken fell into the river. Fortunately, Paisiello was satisfied with the reports of the wreckage, and his friends stayed away from the second performance. And so did Rosini, by the way. He called him sick. Without the distractions, the audience loved the show, and on the third night, the cheering crowd gave the composer a festive torchlight procession, escorting him all the way back to his lodgings. Within a few years, Rossini's Barber had become one of the most popular operas in the world. It was given in Russia, in Russian, in France, in French, in England, in English, in Germany, in German, in Denmark, in Danish, also in America, in Italian. <laughs> Finally, Rossini retired, and instead of writing operas, he presided over the greatest series of musical soirees ever held in Paris. Liszt, Rubinstein, Saint-Saëns, Gounod, all were proud to be included on the guest list. And every so often, the old man himself would perform a couple of his latest compositions on the piano. At this point, Rossini's pieces had titles like Anchovies, Ratices, or Auteurs. And they were all very short because he couldn't wait for supper time. Speaking of food and Rossini, Rossini was a renowned gourmet, an extraordinary cook, and he ate so much that he grew incredibly fat. Never mind the radishes. He would wolf down enormous portions of cambaloni, sausages, cheese, ham, pate, and stuffed pasta, among other things. And then he wondered why his stomach was always upset. But he kept smiling. Even in his final great composition, the Petit Mess Solennel, Rossini had his little jokes. For one thing, the Mass is neither little nor solemn. For another, he directed that it be sung by twelve singers of three sexes. Rossini also wrote an open letter to accompany the work. Dear God, it said, here it is, my poor little mash, done with a little skill, a bit of heart, and that's about all. Be thou blessed, and admit me to paradise. I'll bet Rossini made it. <laughs> ¶¶ 